Chapter 16. Maria Spiridonova. The Commissariat of Education also included the Department of Museums. The Petrograd Museum of the Revolution had two chairmen, Lunacharsky being one of them. It was necessary to secure his signature to our credentials, which had already been signed by Zinonev, the second chairman of the museum. I was commissioned to see Lunacharsky. I felt rather guilty before him. I left Moscow in March, promising to return within a week to join him in his work. Now, four months later, I came to ask his cooperation in an entirely different field. I went to the Kremlin determined to tell Lunacharsky how I felt about the situation in Russia, but I was relieved of the necessity by the presence of a number of people in his office. There was no time to take up the matter. I could merely inform Lunacharsky of the purpose of the expedition and request his aid in the work. It met with his approval. He signed our credentials and also supplied me with letters of introduction and recommendation to facilitate our efforts on behalf of the museum. While our commission was making the necessary preparations for the trip to Ukraine, I found time to visit various institutions in Moscow and to meet some interesting people. Among them were certain well-known left social revolutionists whom I had met on my previous visit. I told them then that I was eager to visit Maria Spiridonova, of whose condition I had heard many conflicting stories. But at that time, no meeting could be arranged. It might have exposed Spiridonova to danger, for she was living illegally as a peasant woman. History indeed repeats itself. Under the Tsar, Spiridonova, also disguised as a country girl, had shadowed Lukinovsky, the governor of Tamboy, of peasant flogging fame. Having shot him, she was arrested, tortured, and later sentenced to death. The Western world became aroused, and it was due to its protest that the sentence of Spiridonova was changed to Siberian exile for life. She spent 11 years there. The February Revolution brought her freedom and back to Russia. Maria Spiridonova immediately threw herself into revolutionary activity. Now, in the Socialist Republic, Maria was again living in disguise after having escaped from prison in the Kremlin. Arrangements were finally made to enable me to visit Spiridonova, and I was cautioned to make sure that I was not followed by Cheka men. We agreed with Maria's friends upon a meeting place, and from there we zigzagged a number of streets till we at last reached the top floor of a house in the back of a yard. I was led into a small room containing a bed, small desk, bookcase, and several chairs. Before the desk, piled high with letters and papers, sat a frail little woman, Maria Spiridonova. This, then, was one of Russia's greatest martyrs. This woman, who had so unflinchingly suffered the tortures inflicted upon her by the Tsar's henchmen. I had been told by Zorin and Jack Reed that Spiridonova had suffered a breakdown and was kept in a sanatorium. Her malady, they said, was acute neurasthenia and hysteria. When I came face to face with Maria, I immediately realised that both these men had deceived me. I was no longer surprised at Zorin. Much of what he had told me I gradually discovered to be utterly false. As to Reed, unfamiliar with the language and completely under the sway of the new faith, he took too much for granted. Thus, on his return from Moscow, he came to inform me that the story of the shooting of prisoners en masse on the eve of the abolition of capital punishment was really true. But, he assured me, it was all the fault of a certain official of the Cheka, who had already paid for it with his life. I had the opportunity to investigate the matter. I found that Jack had again been misled. It was not that a certain man was responsible for the wholesale killing on that occasion. The act was conditioned in the whole system, and the character of the Cheka. I spent two days with Maria Spiridonova, listening to her recital of events since October 1917. She spoke at length about the enthusiasm and zeal of the masses, and hopes held out by the Bolsheviki, of their ascendancy to power and the gradual turn to the right. She explained the brest peace, which she considered as the first link in the chain that has since fettered the revolution. She dwelt on the Rastrevska, the system of forcible requisition, which was devastating Russia and discrediting everything the revolution had fought for. She referred to the terrorism practiced by the Bolsheviki against every revolutionary criticism to the new communist bureaucracy and inefficiency, and the hopelessness of the whole situation. It was a crushing indictment against the Bolsheviki, their theories and methods. If Spiridonova had really suffered a breakdown, as I had been assured, and was hysterical and mentally unbalanced, she must have had extraordinary control of herself. She was calm, self-contained, and clear on every point. 
she had the fullest command of her material and information. On several occasions during her narrative, when she detected doubt in my face, she remarked, I fear you don't quite believe me. Well, here's some of what the peasants write me. And she would reach over to a pile of letters on her desk and read to me passages heart-rending with misery and bitter against the Bolsheviki. In stilted handwriting, sometimes almost illegible, the peasants of the Ukraine and Siberia wrote of the horrors of the Razvertska and what it had done to them and their land. They had taken everything away, even the last seeds for the next sowing. The commissars have robbed us of everything. Thus ran the letters. Frequently, peasants wanted to know whether Spiridonova had gone over to the Bolsheviki. If you forsake us, Matushka, we have no one to turn to, one peasant wrote. The enormity of her accusations challenged credence. After all, the Bolsheviki were revolutionists. How could they be guilty of the terrible things charged against them? Perhaps they were not responsible for the situation as it had happened. They had the whole world against them. There was the Brest Peace, for instance. When the news of it reached America, I happened to be in prison. I reflected long and carefully on whether Soviet Russia was justified in negotiating with German imperialism. But I could see no way out of the situation. I was in favour of the Brest Peace. Since I came to Russia, I heard conflicting versions of it. Nearly everyone, excepting the communists, considered the Brest Agreement as much a betrayal of the revolution as the role of the German socialists in the war, a betrayal of the spirit of internationalism. The communists, on the other hand, were unanimous in defending the peace and denouncing as counter-revolutionist everybody who questioned the wisdom and the revolutionary justification of that agreement. We could do nothing else, argued the communists. Germany had a mighty army, while we had none. Had we refused to sign the Brest Treaty, we should have sealed the fate of the revolution. We realised that Brest meant a compromise, but we knew that the workers of Russia and the rest of the world understand that we had been forced into it. Our compromise was similar to that of the workers when they are forced to accept the conditions of their master after an unsuccessful strike. But Spiridonova was not convinced. There is not one word of truth in the argument advanced by the Bolsheviki, she said. It is true that Russia had no disciplined army to meet the German advance, but it had something infinitely more effective. It had a conscious revolutionary people who would have fought back the invaders to the last drop of blood. As a matter of fact, it was the people who had checked all the counter-revolutionary military attempts against Russia. Who else but the people, the peasants and their workers, made it impossible for the German and Austrian army to remain in the Ukraine? Who defeated Denikin and the other counter-revolutionary generals? Who triumphed over Kolchak and Yudinich? Lenin and Trotsky claim it was the Red Army, but the historic truth was that the voluntary military units of the workers and peasants, the Povstansky, in Siberia as well as in the south of Russia, had borne the brunt of fighting on every front, the Red Army usually only completing the victories of the former. Trotsky would have it now that the Brest Treaty had to be accepted, but he himself had at one time refused to sign the treaty, and Radek, Joff, and the other leading communists had also been opposed to it. It is claimed now that they submitted to shameful terms because they realised the hopelessness of their expectation that the German workers would prevent the Junkers from marching against revolutionary Russia. But that was not the true reason. It was the whip of the party discipline which lashed Trotsky and others into submission. The trouble with the Bolsheviki, continues Spiridonova, is that they have no faith in the masses. They proclaim themselves a proletarian party, but they refuse to trust the workers. It was this lack of faith, Maria emphasised, which made the communists bow to German imperialism. And as concerns the revolution itself, it was precisely the Bresk peace which struck a fatal blow. Aside from the betrayal of Finland, White Russia, Latvia and the Ukraine, which were turned over to the mercy of the German Junkers by the Brest Peace. The peasants saw thousands of their brothers slain and had to submit to being robbed and plundered. The simple peasant mind could not understand the complete reversal of the former Bolshevik slogans of no indemnity and no annexations. But even the simplest peasant could understand that his toil and blood were to pay for the indemnities imposed by the Brest conditions. The peasants grew bitter and antagonistic to the Soviet regime. Disheartened and discouraged, they turned from the revolution. As to the effect of the Brest Peace upon the German workers, how could they continue in their faith in the Russian Revolution, in the view that the Bolsheviki negotiated and accepted the peace terms with the German masters over the heads of the German proletariat? The historic fact remains. 
that the Brest Peace was the beginning of the end of the Russian Revolution. No doubt other factors contributed to this debacle, but Brest was the most fatal of them. Spiridonova asserted that the left socialist revolutionary elements had warned the Bolsheviki against the peace and fought it desperately. They refused to accept it even after it had been signed. The presence of Murbak in revolutionary Russia they considered an outrage against the revolution, a crying injustice to the heroic Russian people who had sacrificed and suffered so much in their struggle against imperialism and capitalism. Spiridonova's party decided that Murbak could not be tolerated in Russia. Murbak had to go. Wholesale arrests and persecutions followed upon the execution of Murbak, the Bolsheviki rendering service to the German Kaiser. They filled the prisons with Russian revolutionists. In the course of our conversation, I suggested that the method of Razvertska was probably forced upon the Bolsheviki by the refusal of the peasants to feed the city. In the beginning of the revolutionary period, Spiridonova explained, so long as the peasant Soviets existed, the peasants gave willingly and generously. But when the Bolshevik government began to dissolve these Soviets and arrested 500 peasant delegates, the peasantry became antagonistic. Moreover, they daily witnessed the inefficiency of the communist regime. They saw their products lying at side stations and rotting away, or in possession of speculators on the market. Naturally, under such conditions, they would not continue to give. The fact that the peasants had never refused to contribute supplies to the Red Army proved that other methods than those used by the Bolsheviki could have been employed. The Rosvertska served only to widen the breach between the village and the city. The Bolsheviki resorted to punitive expediations which became the terror of the country. They left death and ruin wherever they came. The peasants, at last driven to desperation, began to rebel against the communist regime. In various parts of Russia, in the south, on the Ural, and in Siberia, peasants insurrections have taken place, and everywhere they were being put down by the force of arms and with an iron hand. Spiridonova did not speak of her own sufferings since she had parted ways with the Bolsheviki, but I had learned from others that she had been arrested twice and imprisoned for a considerable length of time. Even when free, she was kept under surveillance, as she had been in the time under the Tsar. On several occasions, she was tortured by being taken out at night and informed that she was to be shot, a favoured Cheka method. I mentioned the subject to Spiridonova. She did not deny the facts, though she was loath to speak of herself. She was entirely absorbed in the fate of the revolution and of her beloved peasantry. She gave no thought to herself, but she was eager to have the world and the international proletariat learn the true condition of affairs in Bolshevik Russia. Of all the opponents of the Bolsheviki I had met, Maria Spiridonova impressed me as one of the most sincere, well-poised and convincing. Her heroic past and her refusal to compromise her revolutionary ideas under Tsar as well as under Bolshevism were sufficient guarantee of her revolutionary integrity.